Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Braun for holding this hearing today and uh, uh, the great job that you've been doing with this committee. This is such an important subject. Uh, I want to take a second to introduce uh, Dr. Worthington. Uh, it's, and it's very much my pleasure to introduce her uh, this morning. She's joining us from my home state of Arkansas. We are very, very proud of her and her work. Dr. Worthington is an associate professor for horticulture at the University of Arkansas. She holds a PhD in crop science from North Carolina State University and a master's of science in horticulture and agronomy and international agriculture development from the University of California, Davis. Earlier this year, Dr. Worthington was part of a team of 26 scientists from across the world that assembled uh, the first complete sequence of the blackberry genome. This achievement will be a great help to fruit breeders striving to develop improved varieties that are more resistant to disease and tolerant of drought, as well as have greater nutrition and better taste. Dr. Worthington's cutting edge uh, work is a testament to the importance of modern breeding tools to our specialty crop sector in particular. We are grateful for the expertise she will share with us today. And I'm also grateful she uh, brought us a sample of some of the work that she was doing, freshly picked uh, as she came up yesterday. And so again, uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank all of the panel. And uh, I love mushrooms, so I was glad to hear the mushrooms. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good morning. Chairman Fetterman, Ranking Member Braun, Ranking Member Bozeman, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Margaret Worthington. I'm an associate professor of horticulture and director of the fruit breeding program at the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the American Seed Trade Association. The U.S. has a long history and tradition of entrepreneurship, founded on successful systems of technology transfer from the public sector to the private sector. Public-private partnerships are essential in deploying the strengths of both sectors to develop better improved varieties and bring them to the marketplace. This is especially true for low acreage, high value specialty crops. Universities and companies are both using gene editing tools in research projects across plant species for a range of needing applications benefiting farmers, consumers, and the environment. These include disease resistance, drought tolerance, nutritional benefits, better taste, and food safety. Importantly, this research includes critical applications in small acreage, high value specialty crops. These crops face unique challenges and in the past they haven't been able to take advantage and benefit from modern breeding tools due to high costs and associated regulatory burdens. Many countries have recently put forth policies that exempt or exclude products produced through gene editing from additional regulations with clear and efficient implementation of these policies. However, Differences in key elements of these policies means that the overall utility for plant breeding innovation varies greatly across the world. For example, EPA's recent final rule on plant incorporated protectants, which was published just less than two weeks ago, is causing a great deal of concern in the plant breeding community. EPA's updated policy is intended to address new and evolving breeding methods like gene editing. The goal is to establish new derived from sexually compatible plant-based exemptions for certain plant incorporated protectants that are introduced using tools like gene editing and result in plant characteristics that have already been created using conventional breeding. However, contrary to the EPA's approach to similar products used con developed using conventional breeding, the rule adds bureaucratic levels of layers of red tape for products developed using gene editing. This is true even though the agency views those products as having no additional safety risk compared to those used with conventional breeding. At the domestic level, the EPA rule runs counter to interagency alignment under the U.S. coordinated framework. The rule is at odds with regulatory streamlining enabled and envisioned under USDA's recent revisions to Part 340 regulations. Internationally, the rule is out of step with a growing list of international regulatory authorities that have used science-based rationale to streamline their policies and support commercialization of innovative products. Instead of being a leader in innovation, the U.S. is now at risk of losing out. Our farmers could lag behind in access to latest improved varieties compared to their counterparts in the rest of the world. These added and unnecessary regulatory burdens will increase the cost and time of getting new improved varieties into the hands of our farmers. 
Especially I want to highlight many public sector breeders and small and medium sized enterprises and especially those working in those small acreage specialty crops will not be able to afford the additional cost. All of this is going to force additional consolidation in the industry. Investment in future innovation, especially in gene editing, will be limited to a handful of very high acreage crops and a handful of large companies. Now seed innovation is of course not limited to plant breeding. Modern tools like biostimulants also offer tremendous promise to help mitigate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, conserve and replenish soil health, and improve water quality. So to fully realize their value, it's important that the Farm Bill sets a clear federal definition, as is called for in the Plant Biostimulant Act, which was recently introduced in the Senate and the House. So special thanks to Senator Braun for leading and to Senator Grassley for co-sponsoring that key legislation. Finally, when it comes to research, strong investments from discovery through development lead to better varieties. And this means better outcomes, both short and long term, for farmers, consumers, and the environment. Robust Farm Bill funding for primary USDA research is essential and desperately needed to continue supporting a network, the work of programs like the National Plant Germplasm System, the National Clean Plant Network, and the Specialty Crops Research Initiative. Thanks again for the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of the seed industry and the plant breeding community. We look forward to serving as a resource in important discussions um, related to the Farm Bill as they continue and breeding and seed innovation in general. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're not used to witnesses and senators trash talking each other during the hearing. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Worthing, thank you for your testimony and thank you for the work that you're, that you're doing on agriculture biotechnology. Regulatory certainty is of paramount importance. For decades now, the federal government at large has attempted to harmonize and modernize its biotechnology approval process, which would pull this regulatory system into the 21st century and provide the transparency and predictability developers, farmers, and consumers need. These principles are also key to American innovation, to U.S. agricultural production, and to addressing global environmental challenges. The list goes on and on. The Department of Agriculture made great progress in, the, in this endeavor and should be commended. Unfortunately, last week the uh, EPA released a final rule on plant incorporated protectants, uh, commonly known to as PIPs, that does the opposite. This rule will frustrate U.S. innovation, drive companies to export their staff, investments in technologies to our international competitors, and create market barriers that only the largest multinational corporations can overcome. In short, EPA's PIP rule puts American farmers and consumers last. More significant, it removes another tool from the toolbox that specialty crop producer, producers, all producers, so desperately need. Dr. Worthington, will you, you work in the field every day. What impact will EPA's rule have on U.S. agriculture and U.S. innovation? Yeah, I think it's going to disincentivize innovation, and I think it's going to have a disproportionate impact on specialty crops and on small and medium-sized enterprises and public sector investment. You know, there's been so much investment through Farm Bill-sponsored programs in research, in plant breeding. You know, we find all these disease resistance genes. We do all this work. And what this is going to do is make it more difficult to commercialize those products. So I think that ultimately you're going to see more consolidation in the industry with this regulation. And the innovation will be on a few large crops by a few small company or a few very large companies like you have seen with um, older transgenic technologies, despite the fact that we're dealing with a very, very different technology here with things, you know, traits genes that are from sexually compatible species that have already been produced using conventional plant breeding. So I would just advocate for a more product rather than process-based regulatory framework. And, you know, I want to highlight that the new EPA rule is a setback for interagency alignment. It is in direct conflict with the um, USDA's recent revisions to its Part 340 regulations. 
And it's also out of step with a lot of other countries, including our number one um, seed trading partner, Canada, which has a very progressive science-based policy on regulation of these um, plant-incorporated protectants that you know, are existing within sexually compatible species. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting, Madam Chair, we, one of the things that we've discussed at length, because it's come up through these subcommittee hearings as we produce, as we talk to producers, and again, both of us are out and about the country doing listening sessions, is the amount of paperwork that you have to endure. And it's really, it impacts specialty crops much more than, than uh, the other commodities in the sense they're used to doing it. You know, they, they've, they've just kind of grown up in this. Uh, the other problem is that uh, for uh, conservation programs and things like that, it's easier to get a larger grant than it is a small grant, uh, you know, where the small grant can make every bit as much difference, you know, in, your, in what you're trying to achieve. So, I, you know, the way you can help us is put that at the top of your list. Uh, it's interesting, several of the witnesses talked about that already, you know, brought that forward. But that's something, you know, this is something that's not going to cost money. This is going to save money. It's going to make you so much more productive. It will level the playing field, okay? Uh, but, but there's no, you know, there's just no, uh, you know, if you have a decent education, you ought to be able to fill the form out, you know. And, and, and then the other problem that we've got is, is not getting it done in a timely fashion. Uh, that's the other problem is having to wait on these things. So uh, thank you for mentioning it, and uh, let's really let's really be unified in that. That's that's something that I I just don't think there's any excuse for. You know, those those are things that we can fix. But uh, we appreciate your testimony, and uh, we're going to work really hard to see how we can be helpful in the next farm bill. And uh, uh, like I say, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the, holding the hearing.